Welcome to Solutions with Courtney Anderson. I am Courtney Anderson. I am your host. And this is a show today that is the 170th episode of Solutions with Courtney Anderson. Yay! I'm so excited. 170 episodes in and we're just getting started. So I want to thank you for being one of our community members and being part of the program today. Uh, This program is specifically one of the Educators Eden series. Educators Eden is what it sounds like. It's it's that magical paradise where those of us who are educators or who aspire to be educators or who just love educators, uh, it's that place where we reside, where we have the ability to sort of fill the, the, the desire for knowledge, for acquiring knowledge, for sharing knowledge, um, and it really is our paradise. So our Educators Eden series is specifically dealing with an interesting issue today. Our specific show topic here today for episode 170, and of course I always encourage you to come to CourtneyAnderson.com. That's our uh, central website where we've got our blog, where we have links to all of these uh, audio programs, our radio show. We've also got our uh, video or television show uh, articles and lots of other resources. I also want to mention that if you uh, first came to our program through uh, some of our old uh, feeds, our RSS feeds, our permanent feed is at CourtneyAnderson.net slash rss so make sure you're accessing our show correctly and please leave a rating uh, on on itunes or any other way that you're accessing our program Uh, if you're coming through stitcher uh, share our program on on social media we're doing everything we can to continue to put high quality uh, content or the best quality that we can forward daily uh, five days a week we put a new show out it's anywhere between 30 minutes and uh, as up to two hours and we do that every day and so we are just now starting to move toward uh, focusing on distributing and making sure the show is available everywhere. But also, please help us uh, and, and use your social media to, to share what we're doing. Uh, and again, please support our show sponsors. You'll see that we have have uh, show sponsor links and um, marketing um, uh, opportunities throughout our different show pages. That's how we keep it uh, totally free for people to access and to please support them if there's anything that you see that might be of help or use for you or that you just would like uh, support our show sponsors by accessing and clicking on those links in our program so today of course like i said it's this is a tough this is a tough topic uh we are in educators uh, eden that's why we're here that's why we're doing the show i am you are it's awesome we love it i've mentioned in other programs that uh, i I'm not ashamed <laughs> how much I love information, right? I read for fun. Uh, I just love information. A lot of it is related to things I teach, um, legal, business, um, human resource management, uh, industrial organizational psychology, a lot of the things that I've studied, a lot of things I have degrees in. But a lot of the things I love to read, I just love information, even if it's just totally unrelated to anything. I just love it, love it, love it, love it. Uh, some people call that a nerd. Uh, I don't know. I just call it somebody who loves information and uh, is not ashamed or embarrassed. <laughs> so the reason the show, the specific episode 170 is tough for us is because the, the topic seems so foreign to those of us in Educators Eden, right? So our specific show topic today is why don't students read the syllabus, instructions, emails, etc.? Why don't students read syllabus, instructions, emails, etc.? Basically, the question we're asking is why don't students read communication from the faculty member, right? And uh, like I said, it seems foreign. It seems weird. For those of us who love information, we just read. We love reading. Uh, And so it seems weird to us that people aren't reading when we gave it to them. We gave them information. And again like i said that part of the challenge with this whole show topic why don't they read it why did they read the syllabus why did they read the instructions why did they read my email where i reiterated and reminded them of exactly what the syllabus said right like why aren't they reading this and and then some people get frustrated and they'll say well it's even more frustrating because they're asking me something that i already answered like i gave it them the answer and again let's let's walk it back many of of the of the of the frustrations and 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 the issues with this topic come from this sort of basic orientation difference those of us who love information we just read 
I love reading. I'll read stuff that I don't even have any, really any interest or anything else in. But if I'm sitting somewhere, like I'm waiting in an office or something, um, at the doctor or dentist or something, I will read anything. It's about, you know, it could be something that I don't even really know anything about. You know, I'm reading a magazine about, you know, motorcycle mechanics. It's there. It's interesting. Um, I'm somebody who, when I, this is so, again, I'm just, I'm not ashamed. I'm somebody who, when I, when I, when I have something new that I acquire, so let's say it's a new uh, appliance or something like that, uh, I will read the handbook or the manual. I'm, I'm so into this. I will set aside time. The last time I got a, a, a newer vehicle, so it wasn't new because I don't, uh, usually new brand new cars are not necessarily the best investment, but it was a newer car it was a late model car. Uh, so it was, you know, relatively new. And I also made sure that I made a good financial investment by getting a, it, you know, it was gently used. So that I got a good investment deal. I was so excited. And the first thing I did after I drove the vehicle home was to pull out that, that physical manual and just start reading through it. Cause I was so excited. And I know that sounds weird, but I do that. If I get a new appliance, you know, I got a new, you know, toaster. I read the little instructions manual that comes with it. Why? A, because there's always something in there that I learned that I, I wouldn't have immediately, you know, figured out. And then two, why not? Uh, I've been teased by, by family members and friends that, you know, people basically say, who does this? But I do. And I even keep all of it. You know, I don't, I don't hoard it, but I have like a, 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 a shelf or an area where I put all my little instruction manuals. And then if something happens, I go right back to that shelf and I know what, that's where the manual will be or something breaks or I'm, you know, can't figure out how to make something work. You know, and then when I get to a point where something breaks down or I don't use it any longer I, or I give it to a charity, well, then I give the manual away with it too. So that way I don't hoard, <laughs> but I read it cause I'm interested. And it's always, like I said, you know, there could be something in there I hadn't thought of or I didn't know. So there you go about that exact item and how to use it and how it was intended to be used. It, intend to be used. That's why people who spend a lot of time and have careers where they create those manuals for people like me who don't know exactly about that appliance or that item. So that's where I read it. So it seems again foreign and strange for someone who just loves information that somebody else would be given information and then not access it. It seems weird, but that's because people are different. And one of the things that, again, if you are available at some point, come to the show page. Uh, you'll see there are links to the show page in uh, the RSS feed in each show description. And there are also uh, tags uh, within the file itself where you should be able to see the link to the show page, the full uh, URL. Uh, but come to our show page. And if you don't have any of that, then you can just go to coordination.com, type in the search, you know, episode 170 or, you know, why don't students read? And then it'll all, you know, pop up really easy. But when you come to the show page, you'll see that I asked a couple of questions that I was looking at the research and putting uh, the show together. The first question is, okay, what exactly is it? And most of us think, okay, the syllabus, that's obvious. Everyone knows. That's not true. Uh, So specifically with the syllabus, I've got a quote in the show notes from the University of Michigan, and it says the syllabus for each class, and it's it's a University of Michigan talking to students, right? And and it's literally the title of the page is what's the syllabus and why does it matter? And it's telling the students uh, the syllabus for each class you take at the university is your passport for success. Oh, I love that. Uh, It is a contract of sorts and is filled with valuable information. Okay, then it goes on in that page to list information. So it's trying to tell the students you have to read this. It's your passport for success. It's a contract, sort of. Uh, it's an agreement, definitely. And it's filled with valuable information. Okay. I would think, and I made the erroneous um, conclusion early in my career, where I thought, okay, well, the syllabus, maybe you have to explain to students. Maybe, especially if it's a student. Uh, I teach graduate school uh, right now exclusively, but in the past I've taught undergraduate uh, programs. And so maybe a student is just starting school and they don't know what a syllabus is. That's possible. So maybe you should have a time where you explain to them at the very outset, hey, this is what a syllabus is and here's why it's important. So that's something I think that that University of Michigan source that I link to and and there's a multitude of sources that do this. Try to explain it, especially a new student. This is what it is and why you should care. Okay. I erroneously thought, well, okay, maybe there's something for a new student or a student who has been to school in a long time and they want to make sure they get refreshed on what it is and why it matters. And that seems logical. I did think that you didn't have to explain to a student why they should read instructions. For an assignment um, and faculty communication. If I'm saying it, you should read it. 
That's what I thought, and that was incorrect uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, uh, of course, when I started teaching uh, in the 1990s, then it was prior to the technology we have today. So it was traditional classroom. I was on campus. Uh, I'm in a, a lecture hall. Um, my students are arrayed around me, and I'm, I'm lecturing, and, and we're, we're sharing knowledge, and I'm asking follow-up questions, and, and you know, we, we're conducting our course, traditional, in physical space all um, simultaneously. As the years have gone by, I've transitioned to teaching in different modalities, and now I only teach online right now. Uh, so I teach my graduate MBA students, they're all over the world, uh, and I teach them uh, via the, our online classroom. But it's the same setup. The syllabus, we had a syllabus in traditional physical classroom, syllabus online. Uh, I'm giving uh, lectures and information in physical classroom and giving lectures and information in my online classes. I've got audio programs in there, I've got some video embedded in there, I've got articles. I mean, it's the same exact experience, except that there, we're, we remove the physicality of us sitting in the same geographic physical space at the same time. I thought, again, erroneously in the past, I shouldn't have to, to teach a, a student that they need to read my communication. I thought they'd assume if I went through the hassle of creating it that it meant something and that they would automatically read it because it's coming from the person, you know, in, in, in charge of the, of the program. That is inaccurate. I learned this <laughs> over time because I've had discussions with students and it would invariably be a student who didn't receive the grade that they felt they, that they wanted out of a class and usually it would be after the class had ended and I'd post their final course grades. And then a student, often a student who I've never heard from who ignored me and all my prior communication attempts, they never responded but now they're responding to me. And I had a student, this is years ago now, um, it wasn't a graduate school student and, and it's so different so it was years ago and the student said something to me so the, so the class ended and I had sent communication to the student I mean consistently uh, I have a structure to my courses so that I make sure that uh, I stay on a schedule of communication so if I depending on the structure of the course but typically you know before each next uh, assignment uh, or next time frame, so maybe it's a week or maybe it's an assignment. I'll send a you know a reminder note, reminding students what what's coming up ahead of us and what we what we just covered, and, and reminding them. So I do this, and I do it all the time. I never deviate from my system. And so I send all these notes, and I, the student I never heard from the student had had you know uh, grades that weren't um, meeting the expectations, and so I'd sent personalized notes, try to ask them to reach out to me and, and to address these issues, and I never heard from them. They never responded. Never heard from them. So after the class was over, then the student does contact me uh, and was very anxious to, to have a, a dialogue. So they, so the same, you know, I had been using uh, uh, email communication to try to reach them individually. The same email address, they, they had received all my other emails. They, they used that same address to now re reach out to me. And then they wanted to speak with me, which is fine. So we're speaking and I'm, I'm, I'm asking them, I'm, I'm saying, you know, I'm glad to hear from you, which is absolutely true. This is awesome. Yet all the things that you're upset about that you know the cumulative final course grade was impacted by all these other individual grades that I had been reaching out to you you know for months uh, and never you know heard from you which is fine no one has to respond to a faculty member I teach again I only teach adults right so even an undergrad they're all adults I don't teach now if you teach fifth graders you're gonna have a little bit different perspective on this but it, but it, but to be honest though we have expectations but they they, all of our students are still autonomous to some degree individuals and so they do have their own rights. We can't make them uh, do things. Uh, so basically the student said something along the lines of, yeah, yeah, I saw that you would send things, but basically the student was saying that they were really busy. And they said something like, you know, whatever it was I was sending, they didn't have the time to read it. And I said, I totally understand. I'm, I, you know, who doesn't have time issues in, in life? And, and in between you and I here on the show, I mean, I've had the whole programs where I've talked about uh, when I was a, a an undergrad college student, when I was a teenager, uh, I was really focused on my own imagined um, pressures, and so I would take incredible amounts of uh, course loads, and I would have uh, time pressures and, and decisions I made when I was, uh, you know, not fully aware of how I was um, rushing myself through school. So we certainly all understand time pressures. And I certainly understand if somebody says, hey, I don't want to read that. I'm not interested. I get it. But I did say this. I said all the notes I was sending you that you chose not to read, and which I totally respect um, you. And I appreciate it. And I, I said to the student, I appreciate you telling me this because it's, it's very candid and I do appreciate it. And it also helps explain a lot of what's happened, right? 
said, although you have the absolute um, right not to read anything, but you exercise. I said the notes I was sending were all notes about all of the things you're now wanting, now you're upset about. They were about the class, they were about the assignment requirements, they were about specific issues on some of your performance that I was trying to address and reach out to you, uh, asking you to get in contact with me, or to visit with me during my office hours. And, and again, you didn't have to do any of it, but that's what's related to the issue that's at hand now that you're upset about this final uh, course grade. And I said they weren't, they weren't communications where I was you know, rambling about, you know, my kitten and I went on a walk today in the park, and then I got a new pair of shoes, and then I sat down and I had um, some ice cream, and I had a hot dog, and then two days ago, um, my foot hurt. It wasn't just sort of rambling musings about nothing. They were, they were notes talking about the course, and they were talking about all the things that the student was, you know, now upset that the course had ended, that they weren't pleased with their course grade. That's what I was talking about. So again, totally respect. I don't read everything. Like I said earlier, I'll read something if it's near me, if I'm sitting in an office and I'm thinking, ah, I've never, you know, I've got some time here on my hands. Let me read this magazine about, you know, whatever, motorcycles or, uh, you know, moths or whatever. It may not be that if I was on my own at a, at a bookstore, which yes, I still go to, or, or the library or a virtual library, a virtual bookstore, it may not be that I would pick up and read the the. the the uh, content about motorcycles uh, because I that wouldn't be the most interesting thing for me to start with because I've never you know known much about them I've only I think I've only been on one once in my life for like 90 seconds so it's just not something I know much about okay my point simply is this even someone like myself and I'm sure many of you who we love information we don't read everything and we have our own interests we have things that we like to read we have things that we don't particularly like to read and that's healthy and normal and everyone does that the challenge for us with the with the classroom setting is when it's a and, and this is a, a situation where the student would benefit by reading the information we're giving them and then they choose not to which makes it really difficult then for us to to have them succeed at the level they'd like to when they don't read the instructions or read the the notes from the faculty member who's talking about the instructions Maybe they're giving a reminder. Maybe they're adding extra information about tips for how to create uh, their own uh, assignment and, and giving them some uh, things they might want to prioritize or giving them some ideas of something that would be helpful in them creating their own work. I mean, if you're talking about the assignment and then someone refuses to read that, it does make it difficult for them to be able to access the information that you told them in there. The thing that brings me to a place of comfort with this, instead of getting really frustrated and angry, or stressed out or, or worried or sad or overwhelmed is the fact that again we must recognize that our students have their own choices it wouldn't be my choice uh, if I was uh, in a program and, and really serious and focused on, on, on the academic outcome but let me be really clear I have I am truly a lifelong learner uh, well, we don't know how long I'll live, but <laughs> relative to the life I've lived so far, uh, I, I recently went back uh, to school, uh, and it, I'm always interested in different classes, and I had just earned a, a, a master's degree in 2013. I am, as of recording this program, I'm looking forward to starting another uh, graduate program uh, uh, very shortly. Um, so I'm always interested in, and, and so interested, I'm, I'm constantly thinking, well, if I'm going to read something and study something and and it's, you know, why not make it part of a degree program? Why not? It helps me because it allows me to, to augment the information I teach, and it also allows me to have new interests and, 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 and think about things differently, and it's exciting. So the student I am today at this point in my life is very different from the student I was 20 years ago or 30 years ago when I was in, you know, primary school and middle school and high school. Uh, but definitely when I was in college, like I said, especially undergrad, I was a teenager. I was very focused. Uh, on moving through the program as quickly as I could and in many ways I did accomplish that I, I graduated with my bachelor's degree at 20 years old which is in some ways I was pleased because that I had actually I'd had a goal to graduate at like 19 and a half but um, I got slowed down a little bit <laughs> and, uh, but I did graduate by 20 and I went right to law school I started law school when I was 20 years old so in some ways I feel like okay I was on target on task in other ways though I'll be I ha, I'm all, I to the my own embarrassment I've you know shared in other programs I I wasn't I was cheating myself in some ways because I was moving so quickly that I wasn't taking the time to really sit in a relaxed way and let a lot of the knowledge sink in 
So I would read a syllabus, but I was reading it for a couple of reasons. I wanted to know exactly when the tests were, I wanted to know exactly what the mathematical uh, formula was for the, for, the for the class, because many of these classes, I was moving really quickly. And I would prioritize what class I would go to, when, um, I would also know what class I'll just go read, you know, I'll go read the text or I'll get, I can prepare on my own, I don't need to go to the lecture. Um, and so I cheated myself out of the full experience in many of these programs because I was just moving so quickly and I had my own goals. So I do understand, because I did it. Uh, as a, as a, definitely as a teenager, I was like, well, I have stuff to do, I'm very busy, right? Like the student said to me, he was busy. I read everything the faculty member gave though that's that's the only difference I did read it I was reading it for specific issues right I wasn't sort of reading it and then sitting there and pondering and thinking oh that's a wonderful policy in the syllabus and I wonder about this no I was reading it I was getting the information and I was applying it so that I could get through earn the, whatever grade I needed and keep it moving um, but I did read everything I'll I will be again to my own either embarrassment or whatever but because this was a you know this was prior to the the opportunity now for uh, learning modalities that are not all physical in the same room at the same time. Uh, so when I was in undergrad uh, as a teenager, uh, you know, you had to physically go to all these classes. And I, hey, that's where, even though I read everything, I wasn't going physically to all the classes. Sometimes it was because I was taking, you know, 21 out credit hours a semester, which is a lot of classes. It's more than the average or whatever. Part of that was because I was trying to move very quickly and I needed to graduate. I was, you know, I had my plan. Um, but part of it also was that, you know, I couldn't control those schedules. So some of them are at times that I just was not going to be my best, you know, uh, mentally. And uh, so some of the time of the classes, I just, it was never going to be something I was going to be able to physically go to. And, and, and plus I had conflicts with all the other things, but mostly because, you know, I, that wasn't a good time for me. The other thing is some of those classes I only took because I just needed the credit hours. I was just trying to move really quickly. And it wasn't necessarily because I was interested in that. It was just that, hey, there's a section open. I need something to fill the space. I need X number of hours, and I'm just going to take it. Now, that's reasonable because many classes are electives, right? They're not your, your, your major or your minor, and so that's what they're supposed to be. They're electives. But I wasn't – I cheated myself by not going into those classes planning – you know, or actually doing the going to all the class and sitting there and learning about whatever, which actually in hindsight was stupid, right? And cheated me. Now I I read the syllabus and all the notes, but I missed things that that were said that were in the class if I wasn't there, right? So I'm not going to say that I don't understand somebody not accessing everything. I can make the argument, yeah, I read everything that was given out when I was there, but I missed things because I wasn't in, physically in all the classes, and that cheated me. Did I graduate quickly? Sure. Did I go on to do all my other goals? Of course I did. But could it have been something that would have benefited my knowledge base and my awareness of the world if I would had a different plan and maybe structured things differently and taken the time to go to those classes? Of course it would have. So that's why when I talk to students and they don't read things, I don't make assumptions. A, because I don't know anything. They're individuals and I'm an individual. It may be that somebody doesn't read things because maybe they already know it all. And that happens. I have a students will come through, like myself, right? By the time I went to get my MBA, I already had my law degree and ran my law firm. I was already practicing law. So when I was sitting through, you know, an MBA class on, you know, business law, I mean, I really could teach it because I did. In fact, I was already teaching, I was already teaching in the business school at the University of Texas at Austin when I was in my MBA program as a student. So yeah, I actually did know it. So that happens. And I've had many uh, lawyers and and CPAs and all kinds of uh, professionals come through my MBA classes. So I do get it. Like you don't necessarily have to reread that if you already are licensed and teach that thing and know that thing. So that makes sense. The other thing is I don't know somebody's uh, full life situation. I don't know what their priorities are. I don't know what's going on. So don't make assumptions. I do make it clear prior to the class starting, when the class starts, and all my little communication to the notes – communication notes to the class collectively and to individual students that it would, be, it would be it's expected right required and it would be an asset to them if they would read my notes if they don't though it's not personal it may be who knows what I don't know so part of this is disengaging yes we're educators we're in educators eating yes we love education yes most of the time we probably read all kinds of things yes when we when I have the time as a student now like in my last master's program uh, and the one that I'm planning to uh, move forward with here in the future of course I read everything but my life is very different 
by the time I'm working on my, my last degree, it was my fourth college degree. It was a very different situation. I was a different age, I had a different lifestyle, I had a different um, financial and career situation than I did when I was, you know, 17, 18, 19 years old in my bachelor's degree. It's totally different. I have much more um, freedom and, 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 and resources to be able to take things very slowly and move at my own little pace and be happy as can be because there's no rush. I don't need any of these degrees. No one, you could argue, needs necessarily, it's not required, it's not mandatory uh, that you receive a college education, but by the time you start getting to the, you know, your, your you know, even your second, you know, your second, your third, your fourth, for me, if I, you know, move forward with my, my fifth degree program that I'm uh, planning to start here soon, it, it really is just, you know, topping. It's just, it's just a cherry on top. I mean, you know, so yeah, I'm relaxed, you know, I mean, I, I'm not, I, I'm not even doing it because I, I'm concerned about, I need this, you know, extra degree to get some sort of promotion or whatever. It's not even like that. I'm just doing it because I enjoy it. And I think it's interesting. And it does relate in a way to, of course, all of the work that we do and all of these shows and these programs and all the things I teach, but it, but it's just for mostly because it, it, it's, it's enjoyable. So I'm in a different mental and physical and economic space so I'm very relaxed and I have nothing but time to to sit and read all my my syllabi and and focus on my class assignments and and attend everything of course I'm also attending uh in the last uh, degree and the next one uh, they're also going to be distributed learning so that I'll be able to log in and, and and watch the lectures around my schedule and anywhere in the world I am so there's a lot of things that are different and I don't know when a student doesn't read things what their past, current, or future situation will be or is. And it's none of my business. So one of the ways to disengage where you don't get frustrated or you'll hear people sometimes who are not in Educators Eden and they'll be really kind of negative. Oh, no, no, they don't read anything. Well, first of all, you don't know that. Secondly, I'm sure there are times in your life when things aren't optimal and you weren't able to read everything that you wished you could have. We need to be aware of that. Now, the outcome of them not reading it is up to them. There are people who don't read the syllabus and they get the highest grade in the class. It happens. Partially, it'll happen because somebody already knows a lot of this. Maybe it'll happen because they just already had, uh, were, they were an autodidact and they would already educated themselves. Maybe they're just somebody who has a photographic memory and they can look at something once and the day before or f 10 minutes before uh, an exam or something and they can sort of retain it enough to use it. Who knows? And there are going to be people who read the syllabus and read every single note you sent and read everything, you know, eight times and asked you questions and they still didn't pass the class because they're skill deficiencies, right? So we need to, dis again, disengage from s these conclusions. I ask my students, did you read those? And then they'll usually tell me the honest truth. No, I didn't. Or yes, I did, but I didn't understand them. Sometimes there's a literacy issue. Sometimes there are people who have uh, issues with just, uh, you know, reading comprehension challenges. Sometimes there are people who have, uh, this is rare, but it does happen. Somebody has, they speak multiple languages, and maybe the language you're teaching in is one of the languages they don't use as much. So it's harder for them to sort of pick up on everything in that language. Well, whatever. I mean, but we need to ask. If somebody said they didn't read it, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get a bad outcome in terms of, what the course grade was or what their expectations were. Now, it does happen frequently that you didn't read it and they don't have the outside knowledge and they didn't have the ability to, to sort of at the last minute have a photographic memory and they aren't an autodidact. And then, yeah, so you do see a relationship between failure to read and take the information in. If they already had the information and knowledge, then it won't impact them as much, right? But it's up to them. It's their life. And so, you know, if you go to the show page, you'll see in the show notes, I have uh, some information here, uh, from, uh, and, it, and it's talking about um, uh, do they read the syllabus? Okay, so I've got a quote here from from, from Wesley, and and the and a associate professor says uh, everything is in the syllabus, but most people don't read it. Everything is on there. Now I just added my own tone. We don't know what the tone was. The tone could have been everything is in the syllabus, but most people don't read it. Everything is in there. We don't know, but the point is that there is not just a perception, but a reality that many of the times, even though the, the faculty member has given the answer, quote unquote, to the question, it's in the syllabus, they didn't read it. And sometimes that leads to frustration because we feel like when some, it, here's why it's frustrating because the student will either come ask the question and, and what I'll do is just copy or literally resend them back the syllabus with the information highlighted to show them that I already gave you the answer. 
and to try to help teach them to trust themselves, right? Um, I also have uh, another uh, link there, and uh, it's from the Academy of Art, and it and it says this. So it's asking a question, you know, do they read it? The syllabus, the instructions, whatever, our email. And it says, research examining what students pay attention to on a syllabus indicates that most students pay attention to key dates of exams and quizzes and assignment due dates and grading procedures and policies. And then that same resource, which obviously the links to the show page, uh, goes on to talk about how a new student will also read the policies, you know, about the university, you know, whatever, the attendance policies or whatever, more uh, closely than a student who's a, who's a continuing student or, a, you know, a student who's been in the system for a couple of semesters or years because it's the same policy in all the syllabi, syllabi so they, they, they don't really read it as closely. Okay. Why don't they? Why don't they read it? Why don't they read it? Uh, I have a quote here from a BYU, a Brigham Young University. So let's look at this. Why don't they read it? Again, in the show notes is the link and then you can go read the expanded article. But here's an interesting quote, I thought, from BYU. Uh, why don't they read it? It says, um, research shows, and they have the actual site there. Uh, it says, reports that 56% to 68% of students, so 56% to 68% of students in a first-year class reported that they did not read assigned material before class. The most common reason students give to explain why they did not read assigned materials are they had too much to read, their work schedule does not allow enough time for extensive reading, their social life leaves little time for reading. And those all seem somewhat logical, right? There's only so many hours in the day. If someone has, quote, too much to read, it's not going to happen. If someone has a work schedule, they don't have enough time. If someone has a social schedule, they don't have enough time. Now, sometimes educators, and this, you know, these are adult educators, will get frustrated and, and say, well, your social life isn't as important as you know, work or, or maybe somebody who has, you know, a family or young children or whatever. But here's the point. It's when we're talking to a, a 19 year old and they're explaining their social schedule is the reason they don't have time for reading. Some people, some people who are not 19, who are the faculty member who are older than 19 will think, well, you know, that's not even a, a serious issue. I mean, they can do their social activity at some other time. But here's the thing I want to reiterate again. They are adults, right? And even if they weren't adults, they're still individuals, and they have choices. I had a student when I was uh, teaching undergrad who, at a, at a big campus that had fraternities and sororities and Greek life and so and many other really, you know, awesome student activities, the student was in a fraternity. And he, he, I'll never forget, he came to my office and he, and he basically was telling me that he'd read the syllabus, which is awesome. So this was like right when, you know, the first week of class. And he, and he said, um, but I have a fraternity. Like my fraternity is going on some trip, I think he said to New Orleans or Miami or somewhere fun for something. And um, so he wouldn't, so basically he was telling me I needed to change the date of like a midterm on the, exam on the syllabus because he can't attend it because he's going to be on this important fraternity event. Again, it's the same thing as my adult student telling me later in life that they didn't read the, the syllabus and after they didn't um, complete the course with the, the grade they wanted, now they're angry and, and wanting to have a discussion. I respect people's choices. Now, I was never in a fraternity, uh, largely because these are gender-based social organizations, so uh, typically... Uh, as a, as a woman, I wouldn't be invited or be part of a fraternity itself for, uh, as a member. Uh, so that's part of it. There, there are other reasons why uh, I don't, I didn't join a fraternity. Uh, but the point is, if other people want to, and that's their choice, then that's their choice. And I told the student the same way I told the other student years later, I respect your choices. You have two choices, right? You either can go to this event that you already know is on your calendar. It's important enough to you for this fraternity event. Uh, and miss the midterm. The challenge, of course, then that it's impossible to pass because it was one of those classes where the midterm took up, I don't remember, but like, you know, 40% of the grade was a midterm. So if you missed it, then there was no way you're going to get higher than a than a 60%, which which is not not a not an A or a B if you got 100% of everything else, right? So that was a choice. I said, so that's your choice one. Choice two is you stay in the class, you come to the midterm date, take the midterm, and then you're going to, you're going to miss out on, you know, or have to modify your travel plans for the fraternity. And there might be consequences there, but that's his choice. And I don't recall what the outcome was at this point. It's been a long time ago, but the point simply was, I respected that immensely. 
He's sharing with me some of the things that are important to him and his life and his priorities. And who am I to diminish anybody's choices? For many, many people, one of the most important reasons they go to school is for some activity that's not academic. It could be sports. It could be um, Greek life. It could be, you know, band. It could be art. I don't know. But the point simply is that it's their choice. And all you have to do is remind them that they're in charge. The great thing about the syllabus, especially at the outset, is it gives you a chance to realize, wait a minute, I don't have time for this class right now. I have a big thing at work not going to happen or I have my big social activity not going to happen or you know I'm a parent and my kids have something happen in this class it's not the time for it I don't have the time for it and that's an early time in many schools it depends on the schools and the rules there's some time period hopefully where somebody could see a syllabus and then maybe change the course or withdraw or whatever and not be penalized and that's the whole idea so you can kind of get a heads up this is what this would entail if you stayed here and the person can say yep I'm totally this is a great time for me I can do this or this is not the right time for me I'll take this class next uh, semester or say you know I don't want to take this class at all take something else so that's what the whole idea is and all of that is equally valid if someone chooses to be in the class fully aware that they have the opportunity to read the syllabus whether they did or not is their choice then then it's it's all it's always up to them so if they do read the syllabus, great. If they don't read the syllabus, it's not usually going to give them the best opportunity unless they have, again, some sort of, a, of an extra uh, experience or expertise where they, where they, where they really don't even need uh, the course because they already know the material. Um, absent that, usually there's, 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 there's going to be a higher likelihood they're not going to do well academically, but that's their choice. And we all have different definitions of do well. Somebody may be in a situation where, look, if they get a D plus, that's all they needed, and they are happy, and they're about their path in life, and just pleased as punch. There may be somebody else, and we all work with these students, and we talk about them in our Overachiever uh, Educators Eden show, teaching the overachiever. There's some people who if it's less than 100%, they're just hysterically upset. And it's not even doesn't even make any sense. It could be the highest grade in the class, and they're still upset. It was only a, an A, a low A. Yeah, but it was the highest grade that was given. I don't care. Okay. Everyone's different. What we want to remember, though, is this. It is, of course, different when you're dealing with little children. So you're going to have different tools and availability of different options if you're teaching, you know, first graders than if you're teaching, you know, graduate students. They're just different ages. I have different options with somebody who's, you know, 50 years old as my student and somebody who's, you know, five and a half or six years old as my student. Yet, universally, we have to respect that people are get just that, people. So if they read it and it benefits them, awesome. If they don't read the syllabus or my instructions or my class communications and it, and it doesn't hurt them at all and they got the grade they wanted, then fine. I don't even know, right? It's not even an issue. Uh, what I do, again, is a technique to, to reinforce this is every time somebody asks me a question, I go and see if I've already answered the question. In the syllabus, I also post uh, FAQs, frequently asked questions before the class starts. I also post FAQs every week of a class or every um, every different section or, or, or course that, uh, um, area that we're moving into that talk about that upcoming section based on what people have asked me before. So 99% of the time I get a question, I've already answered it. So what do I do? I literally go and pull that resource or I put a link to it or I attach it and I respond to the student with the quote answer, but I give it to them here it is on page whatever of this course document or here it is when I sent it to the course you know the entire class three weeks ago via email and that's to teach them a couple of things one that they need to they need to trust themselves and believe in themselves more go look around if the answer quote unquote is on the syllabus then trust that that's what it means I'm not I'm not someone who is going to deviate or change or play games with people I mean if that's what I wrote or that's what the syllabus says or that's the policy then that's the policy and that's part of them trusting me. We all know when we think about our own education that most of us have had experience with people who weren't in Educators Eden, and they did stuff like that. The, the policy would say one thing, and they went and did something different. And we all know how frustrating and angry uh, that makes us. It's unfair. So as educators and Educators Eden, we never do that because that, that's the deal, right? We read that one resource from University of Michigan. says the syllabus is like a contract. That's a two-way deal. So once it's in there, as a faculty member, I have to abide by it too. If there's something I think, oh, goodness, that needs to be changed, I have to change it next semester, the next time I teach that class. I can't change it now because it's already in there. That's the deal for both of us, both sides of this transaction. I'm going to follow it, and they're going to follow it. I can't change it, okay? I may have to modify something. Maybe there's a hurricane or something, and, and the university will shut down or whatever, so maybe we'll move a date around or whatever, but we're not going to change the requirements. Um, 
you know, because that's the deal. That's the deal we had. I have to honor it too. Again, uh, there's some links in, in the show page that bring up a couple of points. If you teach people who, are, again, are first generation of school or don't really know, they've never been to, to school and used a syllabus, then you need to teach them what a syllabus is and why it's important. So I have a link to a Washington Post uh, a piece that's talking about that. Uh, the, the, it's, it says um, basic academic concepts, understanding a course syllabus, knowing how to use the library, information resources, attending class regularly, doing homework, can be elusive notions for someone for students who had few such expectations in their prior learning experiences. That makes total sense. If somebody's come from a background where they're not used to those requirements, then you need to explain to them what they are and why they exist and how to do it, and then give them resources to continue to help them. That's our job. Again, it depends on your population. Um, so the last thing on the show notes were some tips uh, to try to get people to either read the syllabus and some reminders. Uh, so there's some links. Um, there's a Colorado, Colorado State uh, a tip uh, link to show you some ideas about how to kind of get people to read your syllabus. And, of course, a lot of these we all know, right? So you, you give them a quiz on the syllabus. Literally, you give points in the class to see if they read something in the syllabus. When is the due date? Or you make them sort of regurgitate back what the syllabus says. And the idea is by tying that to a quiz or some sort of task in class, so that'll sort of make them do it. Some people play games. There's all kind of things people do. The idea is they're trying to kind of, you know, reinforce, lead them to the syllabus and give them a consequence for, for accessing the, the syllabus. That's a positive thing. Um, I also have uh, something that's really interesting that I hadn't totally understood. And this, this, this is a New York Times piece. And it, and it did resonate with me. So again, I'm, I'm not, you know, 18, 19 years old. I didn't grow up with social media and, and the internet and smartphones and all these things. So they're new-ish. And when I went to school as a student in, in undergrad and, and in, in law school and, in, and for my MBA, there, the internet as we know it, it didn't really, it didn't exist. So all this technology is new. Okay. So one of the things that I struggled with was thinking if I sent an email to someone and they received it, right, it wasn't bounced back, and I had the right address, then they, they received it. So whether or not they opened it is their choice and read it, but they did receive it. I didn't understand that, especially for uh, some younger demographics of students, they don't read email. They think that email is, is old-fashioned, right, that they are texting, and they use their social media. So you're not going to, they're not, to them, why would you, why would you send me an email and think I would read it? And so that's what this this New York Times uh, article that's linked to in the uh, uh, in the in the show page, and it was talking about. Um, so there's a professor, and he and it says in a quote on the show page, he soon learned that the students did not know he had changed the reading assignment because they did not check their email regularly, if at all. To the students, email was as antiquated as the spellings. Uh, and they have some spellings uh, in the works by Cotton Mather and Jonathan Edwards that they read on their electronic books. Basically, they're old English uh, spellings. And, and the idea there is that the student, the, the certain younger age demographic, they don't use email. It goes on to say, uh, that's why he added to his course syllabus, and here's quotes, students must check email daily, unquote. Uh, Dr. May said the university now recommends similar wording. So this whole university is saying to all faculty, remember, we can't assume that we sent the email and that it was received at their email address and that to the student that that would mean open it and read it because many of the students of a, of a certainly younger age and different life experience with technology don't read email. And then that same uh, article from New York Times goes on to say at the University of Southern California, um, and it's got a faculty member's uh, class, so Nina Eliasoff's Sociology 250 Syllabus reads, here's another quote, you must check email daily every weekday. And then daily is in all capital letters with bold face for emphasis. So see, this again, something I never would have thought of. Because my life experience, I communicate via email primarily. Uh, obviously because I'm teaching distributed learning and I, I work with my, even in my consulting and corporate education and my private mentoring practice, I'm, I'm, I'm sending and receiving emails. I don't text people. I mean, I, 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 this sounds, I've had people literally just hysterically laugh, but I may send and receive a month, maybe four or five text messages a month, and that's a high amount. There's many months I have zero text because I don't use it. I don't get it. I won't even think to check the text on the smartphone or tablet or whatever it is because I feel like if you really want to talk to me and you're a personal friend, you're going to call me. 
And I, that sounds really weird to people, but that's sort of how I, you know, it's what I think. I didn't understand that people don't check email. And in that New York Times article, uh, it, it goes on to say, um, it said earlier when they're talking about this note in the syllabus that says you must check email daily. Okay. So the uh, faculty member says earlier it was because some students weren't plugged in enough into any virtual communication. So uh, so seven years ago, the, the faculty member says that they put this information about checking email every day because back then, remember, the smartphones weren't, we didn't have an iPhone. It didn't even like exist for the regular market. We hadn't heard of this. So then the challenge was that because we're not, you know, unless you're in front of your computer and you, and you think to log in or whatever, you don't really see your email. And so that's why she said initially seven years ago she put the note in there because people weren't, you know, you know, you had to remind people to sort of go to your virtual mailbox, right? This is a long time ago and people who are younger might not have ever heard of it, but they used to have a, a an audio note that would say, you've got mail, because it was sort of like, just like you would go physically get your mail in a physical mailbox. When email first came along, we thought of it the same way and you had to make a reminder for people, you know, check your mailbox, right? Now, of course, that sounds silly. You, you don't you don't get that. Sometimes people have their uh, smartphone or tablet or whatever set, so they get a little chime or notice or something when they when they have something new to read. Some things come in, but people, you know, it sounds odd weird now. But so she was saying, just seven years ago, the the, the note was there to check your email for a different reason, because we didn't have this sort of uh, instant access all the time to the internet. Now she said she can't remove this instruction from the syllabus, right? That instruction that says you must check email daily every weekday. Because, and this is this is I'm reading from the from the quote from the New York Times. Because now students avoid email because it is quote too slow compared to texting. See, I wouldn't have known any of that. So it may be that sometimes when a student doesn't read a note you send if it's an email, that's because they're not reading the emails. They only read the text. Or you should go put it on your social media, and then they'll check their social media. And there's some some interesting statistics in, in that link showing the percentage amount of the percentage of time that people of a certain uh, age demographic younger spend on social media and then it's you know very high and then it's a tiny percentage super tiny that they would spend on something as old-fashioned as an email and I would only assume other old-fashioned methods um, of old-fashioned technology but the point simply is this a we're in a rapidly changing world we know this the core issue is why aren't the students reading this right it may be that it's that physical piece of paper, it may be that it's electronic online, it may be that you disseminate it via text. I'm 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 going to make the assumption that even if you made change your whole system and and thought I'm going to put it all on social media, maybe I'll put it all on Twitter, right? Like I'll I'll tweet it all. Um, I don't know if there's a modality that we're going to be able to use and that all of a sudden magically 100% of our students are always going to read it. I just don't think it's possible because I don't think the modality is the issue. I think that's part of it sometimes, but I think the issue is that those who are going to read are going to read, and those who aren't going to read aren't going to read. And they have a variety of reasons why. Uh, I think we can be uh, helping ourselves by trying as much as we can to help encourage them to read. But I've had discussions with faculty members, um, even teaching online, who are who vehemently are opposed to the idea of sending. Because what I'll do is there'll be announcements that are posted in class on the home page when the student logs into the classroom is the first thing they see, and they're updated as each important new announcement comes out. But what I do is for the important announcements, which is the majority of them, I'm letting them know if grades are posted, I'm giving them an update about what's coming up next week, reminding them about requirements or due dates or whatever. I will literally copy the exact same thing that's sitting right there on the homepage and then send it via email. And and it's an extra step. And it, and, and I've had the discussion with, with faculty who say, look, you're babying them. And it's a totally stupid thing to do because all they have to do is come to class and look on the front page and there it is. Why would you go and take all the extra time to copy all of that and then send it to them via email? It's a hassle. And the truth is I do see their point. I can't argue that it doesn't take some amount of extra effort and it also is redundant. It is. On the other hand, we know that a lot of our research says we have to repeat things, you know, you know, depending on what it is you're talking about, but you have to repeat it at least three times or repeat it at least five times or whatever. How important repetition is for students to get it. So, yeah, I am repeating it. Yes, uh, I would like to get to a point when we as educators can focus on the educating part of this and and have our students more comfortable uh, with accessing the information we give them. But we all know we've been educating for a while or in different modalities, even on, on campus, when you're physically standing in front of them and physically put a syllabus in their hand, 
You just stood there and did it. That still doesn't mean they read it. So you repeat. And um, again, the, the, the software, the LMS systems are, are changing rapidly. I know the one we have now I'm, I'm using for my university. Uh, it'll, it sends a little, it can be set up by the students to send a little note to them, to tell them every single time something new is posted. Um, which is a great way, I guess, of trying to get their attention. I don't necessarily know if that in and of itself means they're going to read it. Because clearly, I've had communications with students who, you know, I posted it in class, I emailed it to them, you know, and they still didn't read it. But I've had students in traditional classrooms, I, I physically stood there and handed it to them. And they took it and they still didn't read it. So, I mean, again, I think we need to get away from totally obsessing and focusing on the modality. Do We do need to remember repetition because we have so many different... Uh, research results that tell us that we have to repeat it so I, I do think we need to be aware of that and I also think we need to get to be aware of I don't know what will happen in the next couple of years maybe people you know will use the wearable computers the, the google glass and those type of, of, of access and who knows people will probably be maybe they'll you know at some point they may say well forget the text I don't use that nobody uses that you know forget text and email and forget social media maybe the, the next thing will be there. We don't know what that is. But I think the key issue is we have information to communicate to them about the class, about the process, about the grading, about the expectation, about the requirements, um, about the purpose of it. And we're going to keep trying to communicate it to them. And again, it doesn't, doesn't matter to me whether it's a physical piece of paper or, you know, an electronic document. We're, we're still up against the same challenge. How do we encourage people to take, you know, responsibility for their own choices and if they again many people don't need to read that maybe they really are an expert and already know it okay fine you won't even know that then that they didn't read it it's only typically when the student didn't read it and they're unhappy about something that they come and they start being really angry and then the faculty member feels like look here it is i gave it to you multiple times you know but again that old cliche you lead the horse to water it can't make it drink and that's true and our students are awesome they chose to be students. I'm, again, speaking to my uh, adult learners. They chose to do this. They don't have to. And I respect that. And I know for myself, I was in a situation in a class at some time in all the different classes and all these different degrees. That I've had to withdraw from classes. I've had timing or something happen where, oh, this isn't the right time for me. And that's okay. I'm not a, that doesn't define the totality of me as a person. And I've had times where everything was going really well for me and I just loved the class and I was just doing great. And the faculty member just said how great I was and I was so happy and it was wonderful. That doesn't define me either. So our student, it's about the big picture. We want them to succeed whatever their goals are. And we want to do everything in our power to give them the information. But we don't want to go to a point where we're unhealthy and we, we forget the fact that they are making their own choices. So let's provide it. You and I may differ on how many times you want to repeat it or how many different ways you want to do it. To me, that's not really the issue. We do need, we have to provide it in most programs, all programs I've ever heard, taught to in or been part of. And all we need to do now is try to do everything we can to encourage that student to be engaged enough to care enough to be interested enough to read it and again then we need to make sure that it's effective that we're conveying information related to the course and the, and their and the issues they're dealing with but this is not anything negative it's a positive thing one we have a whole bunch of exciting things that we can do to create great content in our in our uh, course instructions and information and the syllabus and the and the rubric and all the things that we provide and we need to continually be working on improving that and making it better uh, more effective. On the other hand, we have to understand that, hey, they make choices. And guess what? So do we. And we don't want to make assumptions and we don't want to draw conclusions because we don't know. All we know is a little tiny snapshot of this person in this certain amount of time frame in a certain setting. And we don't know the totality of the rest of their life or the rest of their experience or anything else. So let's not read anything into it. And let's try to focus on the issue. We need to deliver the best content that we can. We need to be available however you feel that's appropriate. We need to make sure the information is accessible however you feel that's appropriate. And then we need to continue to dialogue with our students and, and ask them. That's what I do all the time. Why didn't you read that? Why didn't you ask me a question? Uh, because I'm here because I love it. It makes me happy. And I'm also here because I want them to be happy. And I respect their choices. And it's not personal. So people don't read and things work out well for them and they're happy, okay. <laughs> People don't read the work, my communication, and things are not what they wanted and they're angry and hysterically upset, again, okay. It's 100% my responsibility if I didn't create a syllabus, if I didn't post it, if I haven't been in class, if I'm not communicating, if I'm not engaging. That's my fault. 
and I'm constantly focusing on all my tasks to see what I can do to improve my process and my system and I'm asking my students uh, on the other hand it's 100 percent their responsibility just like I admitted and I'm I can't I can't be anything but honest there were classes I did not go to the class lecture I did not go so I missed out on some important information I cheated only myself I can't blame a faculty member for that I was an adult even if I was a teenager I was an adult even even before that there are students who cut class in in high school and middle school right we make choices so I don't you can't, I don't blame an educator for a poor choice I made that hurt me when the educator was there prepared and working hard to do everything in their power to share knowledge and try to help me meet my goals that's on me to take 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 uh, up that opportunity and, and engage in good choices if I make poor choices that hurt me that's again my choice I should learn and be held accountable for that so I can begin to make better choices in my life so again this is again a dialogue that it, it, it really is empowering if you think about it like that we as educators need to work our side of the equation, which is creating that content, making it, constantly looking to improve it, right? Everything from the spelling to updating the policies, looking to see, has there been a technology change? Maybe we do need to email it. Maybe we should look and see if there's some sort of way we can post it and electronically note it, let our students know whether they're in a physical classroom or online, because they're all going to have access to, the, to those internet uh, opportunities. Uh, in most instances, our, our students will have some access. And we need to be abreast of these things. So we're updating and keeping things important, uh, uh, fresh for us and fresh for them. That's our part. Now, we put it out there on that platter and we hand it out there to them. Sometimes physically, I've stood in classrooms and put it in their hands, right? Other times, I'm, I'm digitally putting it in your hand. Whether or not they pick it up and use it is their choice. And that's where we need to uh, free ourselves from any type of anger or frustration or stress. Again, we don't know the totality of that student's life uh, and, and what their choices are. All we need to do is let them know we believe in them. We are here for them. We are continuing to work uh, to improve our own side of the equation and we respect their choices and then let it go at that because they have to learn like we have to learn that we're going to have great days and we're going to have horrible days. We're going to make choices that benefit us and we're going to make horrible choices that hurt us. And that's life. That's just, that's for all of us. So this, I think, by looking at this and expanding it uh, in this way uh, will free us to, to be able to, to enjoy creating the content, creating the syllabus, creating the instructions, improving it, constantly seeing what we can do to make it better, more effective, and be happy. And then it's not personal with, with what, what someone chooses to do or not do with that. That's, again, their choice. And depending on who they are and the resources our, our institution has available, maybe there are extra resources for helping them uh, with may, maybe issues outside of class or other things that might be impacting them. That they, we can point them in that direction or, or uh, let administration know that there might be some need. But they have to be the ones to deal with that. And we have to respect, at a certain level, their, their privacy and their own uh, ability to, to, to articulate what they need. Uh, and it's not personal. It might just be bad timing. It might not be that this is an opportunity for them to be able to access what we're providing them. So we need to just keep focusing on our part of the equation and then understand that they are individuals and do have the right to make these choices. And even when they're self-destructive choices, they still have the right to make them and they're not about us because their life's about them, just like our life is about us. It's not personal. So thank you for joining me. I appreciate you so much. This was an awesome episode 170. Of course, I continue to encourage you to come to CourtneyAnderson.com. Please support our show sponsors by accessing our links and uh, advertising uh, and um, share the show on on your social media or or with your schools and institutions. Let me know what I can do individually to be part of helping you uh, get to and stay in your own Educators Eden. And thank you so much for all that you do uh, as an educator.